first going to start talking about congressional mapping and what it looks like. Um, so they're going to be passing around a packet. Um, so I'm going to tell you on the state level what it looks like. So congressional mapping is how we cut the state of Connecticut up so that we are represented equally at the state and the federal level. Okay, so can anybody tell me how many towns there are in Connecticut? Can I get a guess? Huh? 62. 62, any, any other numbers? Anybody else? How many? Close. Close. Anybody else? So there's 169 towns in the state of Connecticut. Flip, for the ones of you that have the map, flip that second page. 169 towns in the state of Connecticut. So, <clears throat> can anybody tell me how many state representatives we have? Hi, my name is JC McCauley. I'm Naisha McCauley, and, and you're, you're watching, watching AccessTV.org. So, can anybody tell me how many state representatives we have? If we have 169 towns, how many state representatives do you think we have? Huh? Nope. Seven. That's a senator. Oh. You're, you're thinking something different. State representatives. So people that are, come to Hartford to, to represent their towns. How many are there? You think there are 162, you think? Tell you yes. So there, if there's 169 towns, there is 151 state representatives in Connecticut. Most towns are like Hartford, probably has about four or five. Um, where I'm at, we have three. And the numbers are the numbers vary. So like in my district, I have the 46, the 47, and the 139. A little odd we have a, a number that high, but that's what the way the districts work. So the other thing I want to tell you guys is I actually sit as the chairman of the Democratic Town Committee in my town of Norwich. So that means that I am the person who presides over any matters dealing with the Democratic Party in Norwich. All right, but there are 151 state reps in our in our state. And they represent about how many people do you think? Nope. Well, they represent the whole state of Connecticut, yes, when they're doing business. But in their district, about how many people do you think they represent? A lot more. Any other guesses? 10,000. 10, Any others? So they represent on average about 23,000 people. So Harvard is a big city, so that's if you do 23 times five or six, that's about population. So how many state senators do we have? Can anybody tell me? We have 169 towns. How many state senators do we have? So should we divide them by two? You tell me. Oh, times <laughs> you tell me. How many do we have? So there's 36 state senators, okay, in the state of Connecticut. And that map is broken up by them representing about 100,000 people, okay? 100,000 people. So there's 36 of them, okay? So the way that they're, they're numbered is if, you're, if there's 151 Senators, you represent the 41st, the 42nd, the 51st. You're, that's what your district is numbered. Okay, so that's something. That's the first part. So, on that second map, do you know why there is five numbers on it? Can anybody tell me? So flip it over. Flip, flip it open. Nope. Flip the other packet open. Open it up. Can anybody tell me why there's five numbers on there? What do those five numbers represent? 
your portion of Connecticut region? What portions? Who, who represents those portions? Is your state representatives? If we have 151 state representatives and there's only five members on there, <laughs> can you tell me what they represent? Nope. You have a mayor of every town or a selectman of every town. What's the other level? If we're talking state, what's the other level besides state? So you have local. State. Starts with an F. Say it again. Federal. This is what those five numbers represent. The federal government. We have five what we call U.S. congressmen or congresswomen that represent the state of Connecticut and Washington, D.C. Okay? Can anybody tell me what, what district, there's five districts, so there's one, there's the first district, the second district, the third district, the fourth, and the fifth. Can anybody tell me, does anybody know who the representatives are? So the first district covers what area? Greater Hartford. Greater Hartford. You guys tell me who your representative is. <laughs> I think I know who it is. Nope. Your, your, your U.S. congressman in this region. Oh. Do you know Ketchup? No. Nope. He's, a, he work, he's in D.C. every day. Oh, oh, in D.C. every day? Washington, D.C. He represents this area. Oh, Paul? Not a Paul. <laughs> I'm going to give you his first name. Let's see if you can come up with the last name. His first name is John. <laughs> And the last name starts with an L. Larson. The second, the second, second congressional district is my district. It's very large. It covers pretty much all of Eastern Connecticut. Okay. Why? Because a lot of those towns are very small. Okay, and I'll explain why in a minute. But his name is Joe Courtney. He holds a huge responsibility. Why? Anybody know what businesses are in my region? It's three major businesses. Three three major things in my my region. Nope. That's one. Casinos. There are two casinos, and what else? It's like Pratt and Whitney, but it's called Electric Boat. Yep. <laughs> All right. So he has major defense contracts. Oh, and we have the United States Coast Guard Academy and the United States Sub Base. So he has five things in, our, in his region that he has to represent every day. So he sits on Homeland Security, different things of that sort. But his job is to make sure that we, he brings funding back for jobs and things of that sort so that electric boat can grow, so that people move into the region, so that they have money to pay their workers, all of that. So those are the things that he goes to Washington for. Um, the third district, anybody, can anybody tell me? What area does the third district cover? That's New Haven? Can anybody tell me who it is? Her first name is Rosa. It starts with a D, her last name. Venus? Nope. It's Deloro. She and J John Larson have been serving as representatives for a long time. Representative in the fourth district. His name starts, his first name is Jim. Last name starts with an H. <laughs> his last name is Himes. 
And the last one, the 5th District. This is the one that is going to be replaced come November. So right now we have Elizabeth. Estic. All right. As a youth council, that's an area you're going to be very interested in. All right. This is the one area that's going to change come November. And it could be a historic change. You could have the first African American female to serve a U.S. Congress here in Connecticut. Johanna Hayes is one of the candidates. You also have Mary Glassman, who is a select, first select man or select woman, I think, in Simsbury. And you have the Republican candidate, which is Manny Santos or Sanchez or something like that, running for that seat. So this will have, be in the bigger election this year. These five represent Connecticut on the congressional side. So what happens every, every about 10 years or so, whenever we do a US census, which is us counting what our population is. This also sometimes gets shaked up. So they may represent a different town, they may cut the boundaries a little different, but what it is is we wanna make sure that each representative is representing uh, equivalent population. So you see like the third district and the fourth district, and no, the third and the first district are very small compared to like the second and the fifth district. And what was the reason I said? Small towns. So, where I live, it's about 44,000 or so people. But a lot of the towns around me have 5,000 and 2,000 and 4,000, so they're small, okay? <clears throat> Compared to like a Harford, East Harford, West Harford, which have large populations, okay? Um, so they represent us in the federal government. They have committee assignments, all of that, all right? So these, when you write to the federal government, these are the people you wanna to write to, all right? These are the people that matter. Who are our two state senators? Anybody can tell me? You were getting at it, you said we had two of them, so do you know what their names are? Huh, what's his name? So Blumenthal is one, Richard Blumenthal. Is one. Can anybody tell me the other one? He's running for re-election this year. Harford has become my second home over the last two months. <laughs> you? No. <laughs> no. Maybe someday, but no. No. Chris Murphy. Okay? Those are your two state senators. So they have bigger responsibilities. They have six-year terms compared to them. These individuals who have two-year terms. So congressional mapping is important because it lays the landscape of who gets elected in those regions. So in some states like California, they have a lot more representatives. It's based off of population and size. So they have more representatives, okay? So when they cut their districts, it's important when we talk about parties. So can, who knows the two major parties? Democrat and what? So Democrats and Republicans, so that matters sometimes when we're talking congressional mapping, okay? The state of Pennsylvania actually had to re-map its entire state. Based off of a court case, they had to go and remap it. Now that has implications because if an area that was dom predominantly Republican gets cut so that it includes Democrats, the person in that seat, if they're a Republican, has to really think now because they have competition with a Democratic base being added to it, okay? So party does play a role because you look at how people vote, which is one of the reasons I'm glad we went over this before we did data analysis because when people are crunching numbers, so that's one of the things that I, I did, I ran for mayor, I crunched the numbers on, and flip your papers back over to that, that triangle chart. So you crunch the numbers based on towns, based on who votes, based on who's registered to vote, based on turnout numbers, so how people have voted in the past years. Um, 
the size of their populations that are Democrat and Republican versus independent, um, the representative landscape, all matters when, when we're crunching numbers. So if I'm in a district that now has three towns that are Democrat, I got to look at that. Because if those towns vote at a higher level than a lot of the other towns in the region, remember I talked about small towns? So if a town that's 40,000 has 20,000 that vote Democrat compared to six towns that of 2,000 that vote Republican, I've got to now go out and get a little, do a little more work to, to get votes. So congressional mapping, it has implications as to who, who gets those seats. Um, and we see it at the state level. We had two or three seats flipped this last spring um, from Republican and Democrat. And it's based off of who you get to vote in those regions. So the three areas, us as an organization, we do get out to vote. So when we're doing get out to vote, we don't pick a candidate. However, we encourage individuals to have a voice in who represents them. So, you know, you hear people say the phrase, if they're not representing me, vote them out. So that's part of it is, is we as, as young people, we don't vote a lot. And I've experienced it because I ran for mayor, so I know. So getting your friends excited to vote is important. And state of Connecticut, if you're 17 and you're gonna turn 18 by November, you get to vote in the primary, if there is one in your town or in the state, and you get to vote in November, okay? That's huge. This year we have a big primary in the state of Connecticut. Anybody know the offices that are up for election this year? Governor, Lieutenant Governor, Attorney General, State Comptroller, Secretary of State, State Treasurer. And in some areas, they're also going to be representing or voting for federal individuals. Now that has implications. The district mapping is important because what did I talk about? We have parties. So in August, each party is gonna be picking who they're gonna have represent them come November. So let's use the 5th District, since there's a lot of controversy around the 5th District. Mm -hmm. They're going to look at that district and they're going to see what towns can they sway to vote their, their way. Okay? So there's some big towns in that region, there's some small towns in that region. Right? So New Britain, pretty decent sized town. Waterbury, pretty decent sized town, are part of the 5th District. So as a candidate, I'm gonna decide where I'm going to spend my time campaigning because it costs a lot of money to run a campaign, okay? They're gonna spend hundreds of thousands, well, millions of dollars. I'm not even gonna sure change it. Millions of dollars um, to win an election. So they're gonna spend that money twice. Some of them have been campaigning for a year to even get the chance to be on the ballot. But now between June and August, you're going to have some people spend millions of dollars just to get on the ballot. Then from August until when? November, they're going to spend more millions to win the election. And these have implications because depending on who we have as a governor, as lieutenant governor, as our secretary of state, as our comptroller, state treasurer, attorney general, it has federal implications because they help bring directive to what they want these individuals to represent in, in D.C., all right? So this changes. It can, it can go. We've actually lost some um, districts in our state because we've consolidated. That's why we have 51. We had more, but we've consolidated some towns because they don't have the population they used to, um, or we just didn't need that many representatives, all right? Does anybody know why there's an odd number in the House and an even number in the Senate? Because when they have to vote, that'd be odd or even. So part of it is, we had, how many time, times did I say we had? Is that an odd or even number? Uh, odd number. So we should have an odd number of representatives. Why is there an even number of senators? Anybody tell me? 
So if we model it after the federal government who has two, two representatives per state, and how many states do we have? So you have an even number, right? 100. It's 100 st federal senators that represent the entire country, but two from each state. So what happens if we have a tie? Can anybody tell me what happens if we have a tie in the Senate and the state? What happens? Who votes? Who votes? Who votes to break that tie? Can anybody tell me? Nope. Your lieutenant governor. So remember I said it's important to know who your he governor or lieutenant right governor now. is? The lieutenant governor is the president over the Senate. So if there's ever a tie and it's at the federal government, it's the vice president of the United States. So right now, it's Mike Pence. And the state, if we have a tie, it's Nancy Wyman right now. But that's why it's important to know who your lieutenant governor is and governor because one, they're either going to be Democrat, Republican, or they could be another party, but most of the time it's Democrat or Republican. And depending on what they favor, each party has its own platform or what they stand for, will determine kind of which way they vote. Okay, so that was important this last year because we had a tie. We had a tie in the state senate. And in order to get a budget passed and other things, we had people that had to vote to break the tie. So these are just important things I want you to know. The last thing on that sheet, it shows you the hierarchy of, or the chain of command of how a party works. Okay, so locally it says, what's the bottom? The blue is the lo your local area. What's the first one it says? Party affiliates or something like that? So those are people who are, are Democrats, Republicans, Green Party, Libertarian, whatever the party is. They identify with the platform. They are individuals who are engaged as to what the party stands for. What's the next one? So those are people who are fired up to get Democrats elected. They don't want to hold office or do anything, but they want to help get the Democratic agenda through. So that means they're going to go out and they're going to help individuals in those areas get elected, fundraise money, because for state jobs, you have to raise so much money to qualify for the position. What's the next one? Precincts or wards. Do you guys know what you run by here in the city of Hartford? Are you precincts or wards? You are wards. You have, you have wards that, for your town committee. You guys run by wards here, I think. So town, that, that's more dealing with how a town committee works. So town committees are, consist of, are comprised of what your city looks like. So if you're, you run on a precinct system, you're going to have representatives, so many representatives from every precinct. If you're run by a ward system, you will have people that are running wards. You have so many from each ward, whatever that ward is. Some wards are bigger than others. New Haven is very, very common because they run by wards, okay? And then you have the other one, which is the regular town committee, right? That's what I run by. So we're one big city. We got rid of precincts, we got rid of wards many years ago. So what we run by is as a town committee, our town committee is split up by our state districts. So that's important to know what districts you are. So as town chair, I have so many representatives from each district. So my town committee has the 45th, the 46th district, the 47th, and the 139th. So we're broken up. 46 has the most delegates because it's what most of our city is represented by. The 47th, we only have a little piece, so we have about eight representatives from that area because they are also represented in like Montville and Salem, ta small towns. And then we have the 47th, I mean the 139th, which is the other half of my town. So we have a total, we can have a total number of 80 on our town committee and about 45 of them are from the 46th. So it's important to know that as a delegate for state, state conventions, when we're locally endorsing people, because when candidates come, each area in town is different. We have a rural section, we've got more of a city-like section, and then we have more of a quiet, um, wealthier section. So it's important to know that. 
okay? Um, and then the next piece is the state. They have the state central committee is one, and then what's the other? Congressional district committees. So some states like California have those. We run by a state democratic state central committee, okay? Um, but some of the bigger states have two because there's so many people. That state central committee would be huge. So they have sub congressional committees, okay? We also have them when it comes to convention time to elect people. So five convention committees will, for each congressional district will convene, okay? Um, and they do the work based on whatever representative there is, okay? Just the way it works. It's a lot, but as you guys are getting older, what's the oldest age in the room? How old are you? <laughs> so, so this is important to you. You going to college? Yeah. So this is even more important to you. Because who represents you determines over the next few years what you get when you go to college. Okay? Those are some of the big things. When I went to college, we got a lot more. Grant-wise, loan-wise, a lot more. Okay? And then the top level is your federal government. So that's the people who sit on, from each state, they have so many members that represent on the national committee level, just like the NAACP. We have local branches and youth councils. A state, a state conference who oversees all the different areas. And then we have a national board with members that represent each region that convene to take care of the business of the organization. Same thing with a political party, okay? The national level helps determine the process in which we choose a presidential candidate, just like we had the Bernie and Hillary fight, the Trump and the Cruz and Rubio fight, same thing, okay? So a lot of the same things political parties go through, you're gonna see here in the, in the organization. And I say that because every single thing that I've seen so far in the last year and a half, I've dealt with here in the NAACP, okay? Whether it be youth representation in the organization or whether it be um, how we vote at the federal level or the national level. So I, w I always tell you th this story, I always tell this story. When I started in the organization as on the state conference level, youth and college members in this organization did not have the right to vote for the adult representative to the national board. In 2009, on our 100th anniversary, uh, we staged a protest at the national convention in New York, in New York, um, holding up the meeting. Mind you, we've got President Obama coming in to speak that morning. President Bill Clinton coming in to speak that morning, and we staged this huge protest. No voting is happening today if we don't get representation. So youth, who's been to the convention before? Anybody? So youth college has their meetings before the adults. We would not get up. And this was since we were hosting it, it was our region, we had a pretty decent size or amount of individuals, about 120 to 200 youth in the room, would not get up. And it took a compromising now that you have a vote when it comes to representing who represents you at the national board. And President Esdale was there, him, uh, Ms. Hazel Dukes, they were on our side. So it was a fight between adults and youth. And that's important here like in the state of Connecticut because before 17 year olds who turned 18 in November didn't have a say. So you're turning 18 and you gotta deal with whoever they elect as governor or president for the next four years. So I was part of that group that went to Hartford every week, every month, to get that bill passed. So that is why this is important. So you guys knowing congressional mapping is important because as a youth council, you go out and you hold debates, you hold forums, you wanna know who represents you. Issues in each district and ward are different. Crime isn't high in the entire city of Hartford, right or wrong. There's certain neighborhoods that are, have more crime than others. So in those other areas, it might be blight or just beautification of the city rather than crime that you're, that you're focused on. So those are the things that you have to know. You know what each area deals with. A representative like in the second district has all these small towns. And I always use my district because we've got towns that have like the sub base, Coast Guard, they're much more, they're beautiful. 
then you have a lot more rural towns. We have a lot of farms. I mean, you can drive part of the second district and there's a lot of farms, just the way it is. So they are dealing with agricultural issues. What funding are they getting, okay? So the next part, I just probably hit the computer, um, is you guys have been doing um, what we call surveys, right? So what's the issue you're doing your surveys on? Anybody tell me? Huh? So that's what you're doing your surveys on. You guys have your surveys? All right. So what are some of the questions you're asking? What is your age? Okay. What's the overall topic? Why are we doing the surveys? Anybody? Can anybody tell me? And is there on a particular issue? Yes or no? Why are you interested in what, what whether people vote or not? Okay. Is there a bigger issue as to why you're interested in people being able to vote? There's no right or wrong answer. There's no right or wrong answer. Ask me personally why are you interested in whether people vote or not. More what? So rights, what, what else is important? The reason I'm asking this question. Okay, so we're talking barriers, we're talking rights. I'm gonna write three things on the board that pertain to you guys. Anybody tell me why I wrote these three things? Anybody know a reason why I would write these three things? Because that's what applies to us. Why does it apply to you all three of these things? Because they're the most three important. What's going on right now with your schools here in Hartford? They getting shut down. Oh, we have no we money. Have, not, we don't have money. So schools closing. Budgets are tight. Budgets, uh, I'm liking it, I'm liking it. This, this is what I, why I asked this question. Budgets, what else? Kids aren't learning. Like Nobody's going to school. Quality of education. And there's, a, there's one more I'm looking for. Graduation rates? That's close, but what's... <laughs> options. Okay. I know, and I don't think any town is this way where you have only one option for one school you can go to. There's technical high schools, magnet high schools, STEM high schools, regular traditional high schools, co-ops. There's a lot of different choices, right or wrong. Mm -hmm. There are some that have more uh, college readiness courses than others, but there's more options, right? So. That is why I wrote schools, because depending on who votes, they determine who gets in to support schools. Budgets are tight, you gotta find money, priorities. So a political party has a priority. What, what, is their, what is your values? And what they have a position on schools. What type of school should a district run? What money should a school get? Who should pay for, for you to go to school? I had the we had the argument the other day where some individuals think that if I don't have kids in the school system, I shouldn't have to pay for education. Okay, I just want you, to, I just put, I put these things out because this is important. So what if they go to college? If, they, if, that, if their kid goes to college, that's fine, they're paying. But if I don't have kids that go to school, they're not in college, I've done my part, I shouldn't have to pay for education. Only the parents who 
have kids in the system should pay for it. Bring these up, these are arguments, these are real life arguments. So who pays for them to go to school? I like the answer, that's the question I ask. Somebody had to pay for them to go, right? So these are the things I want you to think about. These are, this is, when I say these are true things, I sat in a, a city council meeting the other day. The meeting started at 7.30, I didn't get home until 1.30 in the morning. Okay? Education in schools is huge. In Norwich, we're facing almost a $6 million deficit. Okay? It's real. Okay? That's why I wrote money down. Money and jobs. Okay? <coughs> Some of you are eligible to work. You want to work during the summer, right? Yes. But if there's no businesses in town, what happens? No more jobs. No jobs. You spend money in the town in, for the businesses that are there. It's one of the things I always tell people. Young people, they're not like adults. You don't have cars, a lot of you. Transportation is limited. So you're gonna spend money in your own community, okay? So money and jobs is important because one, you pay taxes. So, you know, you may think, oh, I'm coming home with $400. Well, whoa, where did $75 go? <laughs> Goes towards taxes, health insurance, things of that sort. Okay? But if there's no jobs, there's no money, you can't, you don't have the opportunity to grow. So experience is important. They don't be trying to give us no jobs either. <laughs> so experience, growth. And the reason I write growth is you spend money in your community, what happens to that business? Growing. They are able to hire another employee. They're able to expand. Okay? So growth. But then even more, we go back to this point. The quality. So education. You will see during the summer, a lot of your friends or family members come back from college. And what they've learned in high school, what they've learned in college, they put to use. Some of them are interns for businesses. Some of them actually work for businesses. That's important, okay? Your parents pay taxes. If they've got a vehicle, they're paying a lot more taxes, okay? We have car taxes, we have house taxes, we have all types of taxes. You go to the gas station, there's a gas tax, okay? So rep, that revenue is coming back to the state and then comes down to a city. So I know you've been sitting there probably asking yourself, well, why if we're getting money from the state, why, have, if the city's getting money, why are they closing schools? Are they using it for something else? Say that again? Using it for something else? So priorities. Stadium. <laughs> it's a good one. <laughs> I didn't hear what he said. Stadium. Oh, All right, so priorities. <laughs> priorities, priorities. Okay, and that is why I wrote activities. What activities really are there for, you, for youth in your community. If we're talking high crime, we're talking kids getting in trouble, not so, not, not so much crime, but them getting in trouble, what is there actually for them to do that's feasible? So we're talking about kids that parents may not have a job, oh, parents may get laid off, what is there to do? Um, on Friday, I go to this basketball thing every night. Program? No, it's, it's only on Friday nights, and it's open to two o'clock. It's from oh. 6 to 2. Okay, so, so that's one opportunity. We got the stadium. And it's Parker Memorial Center. Okay, is it, open, it, is it open late? It used to be, but they started fighting, I guess, and they started kicking them out at 6, and it's only adults now. Okay, at six. so that, that's another thing, the change of the dynamic of ages is important. Those are good opportunities. So that is why I wrote this, because this is gonna get into why, we, why are we actually doing this survey, okay? What I actually did is, I, I'm not gonna sit here and do like other presenters would do, I'm not gonna make a PowerPoint that's gonna bore you, that really you can't relate to. So I 
But I was going through PowerPoints you know, all week long, and I said, you know what? I did this for a whole year and a half. So I pulled up what I did as my senior seminar project when I was in college. And it's gonna go over, it's gonna give you an actual example of what, how you come up and how do you use data, okay? So mine actually was based off of, I went to school for biochemistry, okay? So I, I'm a little nerdy, me. But my sim, senior sim project was based off of what, what, what you would call the consumer protection agency's job, which is people, you, you have all these soaps and different things that you use, do they really fight antibacteria or bacteria. So I did a little research and it comes up with you having to know some terms and doing your own background information. And the first part you have to get to, oh, hold on. All right, is I gotta know what I'm what I'm researching. So what is antibacterial chemical? That that's what I had to do. So that's why I had you do this. What am I doing my survey for? Why do I care who votes and why they vote? Okay, this is why you care. Okay, everything you do is with a passion. There's some there's an underlying reason. Okay. There's an underlying passion, <clears throat> okay? So for me, I needed to, I had to describe what I'm looking at, okay? So for me, what the active chemical is. So antibacteria is an active ingredient here, what it, why it is used, and how they classify it, okay? So we classify voters as non-voters and voters, Democrats, Republicans, and Independents, okay? But that is how you start. Then the other thing is, is how am I gonna break my results down? So for me, I did triclosan and trichloroquine, which are two of the chemicals you find as active ingredients in soaps, okay? So you have to break down, what, what, what am I really doing this for? What is my purpose, okay? You gotta find the terms. So if I'm looking at it, voting, these are some of the things that I wanna know. Why are schools closing? Why are budgets tight? What is a budget? What is quality education? What are options? What are the activities going on in my community? That's why I'm asking you all these questions. What experience do I get for, for a job? And what money does, how does it help a business grow? And why is education important? So everything kind of ties together. You're asking yourself all these questions, okay? So the next, I define what they are. So for me, I define what trickle sand is and I just define what trichloroquine is. Oh, man. So, then I ask myself the question, what is mutagenicity? For me, that's important because that's what I'm testing. For you, what's your question gonna be? Why are people voting? Say it again. Why are people voting? Why are people voting? That's what we're, we're looking at when we're looking at the data. What's another question you can ask? So we have why people vote. Oh, I said why aren't people voting? Correct. Why aren't people voting? What else? Where's this money going? So where's money? Money. Go. Who votes? Priorities of voters. So that's how I'm going to define it. Okay. You're going to have some of this. Can I have somebody serve me? So you're going to have some of this information. Okay? Who votes? You kind of know. You have the race. So you have really good data. Okay? So that's the question you're going to ask. So the next, you need to define how you're going to, how you did it. 
how you got where you were. So there's a process. You didn't just come up with these questions overnight. You didn't sleep on it and then wake up and write all these questions down, right or wrong. We sat, you probably brainstormed what was important, what the topic was gonna be, and then you came to a consensus of how you're gonna do it. So step one is, was what? You brainstorm, okay? So step one, I brainstorm, or you guys brainstorm. So you brainstorm ideas. Step two, what did you do? Huh? Select ideas. What's third? Formulate questions. Then what's next? Collect data. Then what are we doing now? Analyze. Okay, we're at the analyzation point. And then the final, what's the next step? What's the last step you're gonna do? Huh? From the conclusion. So you're going to be able to say, people 18 and 24, I think that's what it is, 18 and 24, vote poorly compared to people that are 45 to 54. Or those that are 65 to 74 vote at the highest percentage. So based off your numbers, you're going to be able to know these things. OK? Here you go. So how do we get there? I'm just going to go through this, and then we're going to come back. So, you know, I come up with all these experimental procedure things. I do all of that. I explain. You guys have a survey, but I explain what I did as a testing. So how, what tests I did, what it looks like, okay? You may show what your survey looks like, okay? For me, I, I show them what the AIMS test looks like, okay? What the disk looks like, what, what, what am I supposed to see? What am I looking for? Okay, and then I give kind of like an overview of what some of the conclusions in my results, I give them the results of the other tests that I did. So remember that whole experimental thing? These are the results for each layer of whatever you're looking at. So for you, these are going to be one question based on age, one based on race. You have all of those different areas, OK? Then I show what the data looks like. So this is what we're going to go over. So you're, you're, I know you're looking at why does he have this bar graph up here? How did he get to this bar graph? Okay, so I explain. That's what I have to explain. So it shows all of them that I'm going to explain. It has what my control groups are. So on the bottom, for some of you, that's going to be race, and how many people from each race votes. Age-wise, the different age groups, and how many people from those age groups vote. Um, you could do gender, from each gender, how many from that gender vote. Party-wise, so you're going, that's how your graph is going to look. So this is what it's going to look like, OK? Then I come up with, after looking at my results, and we're going to come back to this point, is what else could I have done? OK, so what are some of the other things that I could do, or, or what other questions could I ask to get the answer that I'm looking for, OK, to help me be a better participant in my community to get people to vote, OK? So these are additional questions at the time where you're going to look at the results and ask yourself, what are some of the additional questions I could ask these people based off of the answers they gave me, OK? And then I come with those conclusions. So based off of the results I have, this is what I came up with, OK? So the question you, I know you're asking is, well, how do I calculate or how do I analyze the data? Well, most of you. I've taken math at this point in life, right? Yep. <coughs> Anybody know how I find the average? So write the word mean down. Okay? You need to find the mean of every single group. 
So this is going to take everybody's results coming together. So if how many surveys did each person get? Ten. Huh? Ten. So each how many total people were there? What do you mean? How many total people got surveys? So let's just use the number, we're gonna use number 10. So we have 10, sur 10 surveys per person, this marker's dying. Do you have another marker? Yeah. So we have 10 surveys. Bear with me. 10 surveys. Each person got. So each person got 10 surveys, and about 10 people got them. I know how you guys know how to abbreviate because you text. So you understand when I put PPL, you know what it means. Okay? So how many total surveys is that? 100 surveys. So we are oh, talking. No, no, no. It wasn't about 10 people that got 10 surveys. I'm just using an average number oh, okay. that are going to come and that are going to help you. So we're going to say about 10 people bring all their surveys. So that's 100 surveys we've been talking about. Okay? So what number am I using for each question? I should have how many answers for each question? Say it again. So if I have 100 surveys, mm -hmm. how many answers should I have for each question? So the question on race. How many answers should I have? A hundred. This is important. For age, how many should I have? One hundred. I should have a hundred answers for each question. And why is that important? Because what am I trying to find? The average. Averages. So, I'm going to know. So for race, how many options are there? How many different races did you have on the sheet? Well, four, then five, the fifth one is I prefer not to answer. So you have five answers, right? Yes. Yeah. So for that's race. There's five, five answers. So I want you to make sure you write this down. So out of 100, so I'm going to have out of 100, five times, whatever the total number of individuals that answered that question. So how many whites? Say I have 16. Blacks, Hispanic, I think it is. Excuse me. Black and Hispanic is together? No. No, no. Actually ranking by itself? Yeah. yeah, black. So say I have 32. Four, what's the next one? Hispanic, Latino. Say I have 25. What's next? One. American. Um, Indian? Native American? American? Um, say I have 15. And then I prefer not to answer. So, so, say I have, oh, let's see, let me add them all up. I should do that too. Eight, four, five, seven. <laughs> so, how do I figure out what, what the answer to these fractions are? If I want to know the percentage, what do I do? Divide, and divide each one. So, can somebody divide it? Each one of these. Isn't it just 25%? Huh? That's what I want, I want to know. <laughs> you can tell me. What is it? 16%, 32%, 25%, 15%, 22%. And 22%. I made it obvious for you. I made it easy. Okay? But this number, you figure it out per question. So you got to do this for every question. You got to find a percentage of how many people answered that, that whatever answer it is. Okay? So I'm going to do the same thing for the first one. For each age group, how many people in each age group answered, checked it off, okay? And then, what can I, so what can I infer from these results? 
So this is white, I said, African American, Hispanic. Huh? White, Caucasian, I mean, Caucasian would be what you find in most surveys. But you guys know the difference. Native American, and then they did not want to answer. So no answer, I'm just going to say that. OK, what can I infer from these results? That African Americans vote the most. So they don't. out of this, from our survey. Well, that they took the survey. Not necessarily. So there's two things you can. That, that is actually one point. So 32%, and this is important because it represents your population. So 32% of African Americans answered this survey out of your 100. 32% were African Americans. 16% were white or Caucasian. 25% were Hispanic. 15% were Native American. And 22% did not want to be identified by race. Okay? Why is that important? Because then these can relate to whatever the other topics are. Okay? So you're going to say 32% of African Americans, possibly, based off of what you get, are registered to vote and vote. But also, this shows you what your demographics and your community look like. So what populations are, are much more prevalent here? What do you see more? African-American. So if your results reflect it, you've done your job by engaging your community. OK? So that's part of the analysis. When you're, I'm tolling it up, I want, if I have 100 responses, I should have 100 answers. OK? So when I look at this, and this is good that you guys did race, because then it looks like, did I do my job by asking the right people in my community? And based off of these results, you did. Okay? So this is what you do for every single question. So I'm going to do whatever number of total surveys, and then I've got a tally. So you're going to tally up the number of answers in from each option. Okay, so that's going to take the work of all of you. Okay, and then you've got to total it up, put it over the number of surveys you have, divide it out for a percentage. But what other way could I do this? So I could do a bar graph, which you've seen up there, and on the bottom I have my, my groups. Okay? And then on the side, the number answered. So I can use these top numbers to say this is 120. Out of 120, you can show the numbers. You, you can, they, people can then visualize, based off of my graph, what the numbers look like. So who has a higher number? So you can do this as a bar graph. What other way can I do this? A, um, a line graph? Line graph? Well, there's one that I'm really looking at. It goes into what you have down here. Anybody know what that kind of a graph is called? Uh, pie graph. A what? Pie graph. pie graph. Because it will break out the percentages based off of your total survey of what it looks like. So you're going to have bigger pieces of the pie, smaller pieces of the pie, medium-sized pieces of the pie, and they're going to show the results. So bar graphs and pie graph are going to be two of your best. Line graph is tricky because it depends what you put as your lowest number and what you put as your highest number. And you've got to be able to explain it carefully. Okay? So that is important. Okay? Now, looking at your survey, we've now figured out, we know how to find the, the averages. Okay? This is the most important piece. You want to know, for your surveys, you guys want to know the average and the total number of people. Okay? So I want you to write these things down. You're going to find the average and we know how to find the average now, right? Percentage and the total number. Okay? These three things for your survey is important. Okay? And this is going to be found by group for each question.
okay? Each question, you're going to find these. The percentage, the averages, which is based off of your percentage, and the total numbers, okay? So at one point, you got to have a cutoff time, okay? So if only seven people show up and you only have 82 surveys, 82 is your what? My total number, okay, and that is so. What's gonna so eighty two is gonna be where when I when I, when I figure bottom. out the percentage? It's gonna be my bottom number, which is called the what? Denominator. A what? Denominator. Denominator. Okay. So this is how you're gonna do it. So then, what are the two ways I'm gonna show my my data? What are two ways? Okay. Pie chart. The marker's terrible too. <coughs> Pie chart. and a bar graph. Okay? For you, these are the two easiest ways for people to come with a conclusion, okay? Before I get here, what do I have to do? Can anybody tell me? Looking back at our steps, what do I have to do? Get the data. Huh? Get the data. We have the data. What do I have to do so that this part is easy? Coming up with conclusions is easy. What do I have to do? Come back over here. Analyze. I need to select ideas and formulate questions. Mm -hmm. So what, once I find my data, what are the questions that I want to ask? So for you, you've already done it. We, we had this conversation. Part of it is I want to formulate these ideas as to who votes? So by race, what, what races are voting? Okay? What age group is voting? What, what's another question? Um, yeah, who's yeah. registered? Who's registered? So what are they, some of the answers for that? Yes, no, I'm not a U.S. citizen, I'm not eligible for other reasons, or I'm not sure. sure. So that's important. So we're, we're now talking immigrants. Convicted felons, maybe. If you're People, felon, you can't vote. Huh? If you're felon, you no, you can. But you have a, it's a misconception. You have a lot of people in your community that are that can register to vote. You have, once you have served your time, you are eligible to vote. Okay, that's important for you guys because you're going to go out I registering people. I thought it was if you were if you're on parole. Oh, parole, parole is the only one. They haven't finished serving their time. Or probation. Probation, you can you can register to vote. Parole is the only one. And hopefully, hopefully soon, that won't be the case. I think in um, Louisiana, yeah. they're allowed to now. Yeah. Okay? But these are important because this helps you formulate the idea of, what am I going to do with this data? Mm -hmm. Why is it important to me? So when I'm talking school closings, I can now compare this. How many African American students are there in the school system? How many white students are there in the school system? That's important because I can, I can relate those numbers to that question, those questions. I look back at my survey and I say, wow, 42% of African Americans we, we asked the question to is compared to how much, what's the percentage of African Americans in the school system? Compare that percentage to the um, percentage of African Americans that are registered to vote in the city, okay? So these are the things you're, you want to ask, and your advisor is going to help you find these questions, OK? But there's somewhere else you're going to go to get data. I'm going to, I'm going to write it down, and, I want you, and uh, you guys can task who you want to ask. Go call and ask the question. Your register of voters. Why are they important? Anybody tell me? You said why the register? Why are the register of voters? Why are they an important person? Because they can vote and that's who's gonna put in people in office. Nope. That would be a town committee, campaign manager. Why are, is a register of voters important? Anybody know who, what they do? So, in the state of Connecticut, that is what we call pretty much like our election clerk. When somebody registers to vote, they get that slip. They get the name, they get the address, they get all your information. 
so that when you show up on election day, I pull out my wallet, pull out my ID, I'm so and so. This is where I vote. So they send me this nice letter in the mail, and it tells me where I vote, where my precinct is. So say I want to get involved in town committee, and in which area I represent. Because remember what we talked about with congressional mapping, it's so, it's so perfect, they go together. Congressional mapping, if I'm in the second congressional district, I want to know who my representative is, right? If I'm in the 46th district, I want to know who my state rep is, right? If I'm in, like for me, I'm in the 19th senatorial district, I want to know who my state senator is, okay? So somebody has to call this register of voters, and I want you to write these questions now. Somebody write them now. Tom, you are the Greater Hartford Youth Council, and you are looking for some data. Can they tell you the percentage of residents in Har the city of Hartford that are registered to vote? What is the, the, the ratio? Um, so what is the percentage or what is the number? So you want the percentage and the total number of residents in the city of Hartford that are registered to vote. Then what do you think the next question I'm going to have you ask them is? Are they voting? What percentage of registered voters actually do vote? Write that down. What's the number of registered voters that actually vote in the city of Hartford? What's an, that's the next question I'm going to have you ask. Well, no, how are what, they voting? What races are voting? So I, I want your question first. How are they voting? How are they voting? So can you tell me the breakdown of, by party, how many Democrats are registered to vote, how many Republicans there are registered to vote, and how many independent? Because I think that's only three. OK? What else? There's one more question I'm looking for, I think. Anybody know? So if I figured out breakdown by party, and I figured out a breakdown by race, did I say race? I think I gave the answer away. Did I say race? I think I said that. She, I think she alluded. All right, so what, did you, what questions do you have so far? I think I, I gave like, the answer I was away. like, what races are voting? So what races are voting? So do they have a breakdown of by race who is voting? So could you tell me by breakdown what races, um, the percentage of what each race and how they and whether they vote or not? Okay. And then there's I think one final question. Can they give me the age breakdown? So what age groups are registering the vote and are voting? Can she give you that percentage? Or he? It can be a he. She. It's a she. Okay. And you get this answer from either. They should be able to give you a total. I don't care if they're, yeah, their job is, even though they represent, each represent one party, they should be able to give you the total numbers, okay? And I want you to ask them this question based on the last, so which election would it be? The 2000 and? There's one right here, 2016. 2016? That's the one I want because that's the last time we had a state, statewide. It's the last time we had a statewide race. That's when we had state senate and state reps. But based off the 2016 election, so they've had plenty, plenty of time to crunch these numbers. They should have them. <laughs> the reason I'm going to have you at us, and then I want somebody to send me that information, and then I tell you, I will tell you ne what next to do. But that's going to help you when you analyze what you have, help come up with a conclusion. So in 2000, and what year are we? 18. This, these are the people who are, are, are voting and by race. And in 2016, these were the numbers. What's the difference? Are things changing? Well, I talked about, remember, when we talk about redistricting, depending on the areas, some are more what? 
Democrat versus Republican. So like in, for example, in Norwich, I know we have a three to one ratio when it comes to Democrats to Republicans. So we have way more Democrats than we have Republicans. However, when I look who voted, Republicans outvoted Democrats the last four years. Or at least, yeah, last four years. So four years, well, three and a half. The Republicans took over the city council. They took over the Board of Ed. And this past election was the first time we got control back of the Board of Ed. Still showing on the city council, but it shows who's voting. Okay? So just because there's more Democrats in a, re in a region doesn't mean Democrats are voting. Just because there's more Republicans in a region doesn't mean Republicans are voting. And the reason that's important, and I'm glad you guys are using the 2016 election, is because a lot of people didn't vote in the presidential election because they didn't like either candidate. Okay, so those are the things I want you to think about. Okay, questions? Voted, but just to know the race of registered. Sure. Okay. So they're going to know the percent. I want them to find the number of percentage of total, total percentage of registered in the city compared to the population. So out of a population of such and such, 43% of registered to vote. By race. By race. Okay. Okay. That was number one. So those, those, I want somebody to find those things. You can get their, my email from them. Send me that data. I'm not going to give you time on it. I'm not going to do that. I mean, so much time Who's going to contact the registrar of voters? City of Hartford, registrar of voters. OK, and you, you make sure you explain who you are and what you're doing. And she should give you that information. If she doesn't, get back to your advisor. She'll send a nice, lovely email over to the mayor. I'm being serious. Mm -hmm. They should have this information. City of Hartford, registrar. Registrar of voters. Yeah, you can find her, um, her email and contact. And if she is able to get, if she is able to email it to you, that's fine. If she wants, if you can ask her also, can you pick it up? Because you can make copies of it for your other members. Mm -hmm. Okay. These are important because what are, what's important to you guys? Why are schools closing? Quality of education, things to do, high crime. What, what, where, why are people voting a certain way? but we're not getting that representation. So those are the questions you're asking. And that's an important piece of the NAACP. We're not picking a candidate, but we have a platform and an agenda as to people being held accountable for the things that they say they're gonna do. Okay? It's one of the biggest things. We had a nice, lovely meeting last Saturday. Okay? So you, you've seen, I mean, how hot our state president was, right? Okay, any other questions?